So it's really dawned on me that Norse mythology is going to be a lot more important to the series than I may have realized, especially since the confirmation of the existence of Yggdrasil in Elbaf since chapter 1127, what with Yggdrasil being a very central element within Norse mythology. Oda seems to be leaning in quite hard into the Nordic culture and Nordic cosmology, naming characters and elements within his series and within the Elbaf arc directly after things that actually exist in Norse mythology. And to be fair, this isn't really all that surprising. We've known of Prince Loki for quite some time now, who's also a very important figure within the Norse pantheon. And so we have all been long aware, or we've long assumed that Elbaf will be heavily influenced by Nordic culture. But it really got me thinking, just how much do I really know, or do you really know about Norse mythology? And just how much will not only Elbaf, but the entire series be related to this ancient culture and this ancient tradition. For example, will Yggdrasil reveal the existence of different types of giants within the series? Will we find out that Elbaf consists of nine different regions, sort of similar to Wano Kuni? Could the Yggdrasil be the source of devil fruits? Could it be the source of life itself? So naturally, this got me really into researching Norse mythology. And I just want to discuss some of the things I came across which I think may be relevant to the series. And I'm not gonna lie, I think I got in a little too deep. Like I'm talking, listening to podcasts, debating the accuracy of the very source material that has been the basis of our modern understanding of Norse mythology. I've been looking into the Christianization of Norse cosmology, how other religions than the original pagan religion has bled into influencing the traditional Nordic folklore. And although I doubt that Oda has dove this deep into the rabbit hole, we do know that Oda definitely does his research. He takes inspiration from some of the most obscure folklore from various cultures, including for some of his very, very important, very major character and plot developments. I'm looking at you, Joy Boy. So I definitely think that having some knowledge of Nordic folklore, of Nordic cosmology, is going to be very helpful for us, not only in understanding Elbaf, but possibly beyond, especially as we delve deeper and deeper into the final saga, which is obviously going to deliver more and more in terms of lore about the One Piece world and the One Piece history and the One Piece universe. So. Let's dive right into it. But before we do, friendly reminder to please subscribe if you're not already. It is September and I would really love your help to get to 100k subscribers. If you're already subscribed, great. Now you can like and comment on the video instead. Okay, now I'm not going to go into the whole history of Nordic cosmology, but it's important to note that most of our modern day understanding of Norse mythology comes from written sources that were recorded around the 13th century, namely the prose Edda and the Poetic Edda, written by an Icelandic historian and scholar named Snorri Sturluson. Whereas, traditional Nordic mythology is estimated to have been developed much, much earlier, anywhere from 500 to 800 BCE, which is over 2000 to 3000 years ago during the Iron Age. Meaning that what we understand about Norse mythology is likely to differ from what was originally developed or what was originally believed millennia ago, as it was originally an oral tradition. And so accounts and traditions, accounts and beliefs may differ from regions and between generations, which is a fascinating history and I highly recommend you to all look into it. But for the purposes of our discussion, and in relation to One Piece, what is important is that these written records, even if they're not 100% accurate to the original beliefs, it's likely that these records reflect the beliefs that were held by the people around that time. And given that the Viking Age is around the 9th to the 11th century, it's more likely that these written records reflect the beliefs that were held by the Vikings because that's much closer in age 
age or much closer in history. And that's important to us because Oda has been very heavily inspired by Vikings, not only in creating the Elbafian giants, but I would argue beyond. Vikings or Viking influence has been long apparent throughout the serialization of the series, even aside from the Elbafian giants who were introduced quite early in the series in the Little Garden arc. Even earlier than that, in his post-chapter notes for chapter 10, Oda already expressed his interest in Vikings, calling them one of his favorite kinds of pirates. At another point, a few chapters later, Oda goes as far as to say that his childhood enjoyment of an animated TV series called Little Viking Vicky, he explicitly says that this is probably what began his interest in pirates in the first place. And so although there are obviously lots of different inspirations, lots of influences that has resulted in the creation of the greatest series known to humankind, Vikings as an early form of seafaring adventures, earlier form of pirates, that has been a major source of inspiration for Oda. You know, fans have long pointed out the similarities between the god Tyr and the wolf beast Fenrir who bites off Tyr's arm and its similarities to Shanks and the Sea King who eats Shanks' arm. And that is obviously a major moment for the series, a major moment that is established as early as chapter 1. And the Tyr and Shanks connection is actually one that I have discussed at length in another video. If you're not really familiar with that Norse mythology, I highly recommend you to go watch that video. You know what, I'll probably end up naming quite a few of previous videos, so I'll list them all below. And obviously, since Shanks, we have seen other lots of influences. Dorian Brogi, the new warrior giants, Elbaf, and of course, Prince Loki, which as I said, Oda has directly taken that name off an existing character or existing figure. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves, so let me start from the beginning. Norse mythology, also sometimes known as Scandinavian mythology, refers to the stories and beliefs of ancient North Germanic people. It starts off with a being called Ymir, a primordial giant, meaning that Ymir was the first or the earliest known giant, and Ymir is attributed to being the creator of all giants, or according to its Nordic name, the Jotna or the Jotun. Ymir is said to be evil and to represent chaos. His own unsettling birth as well as his unexplainable creation of giants and of other creatures who somehow appeared from his body. This reflects the primal and the untamed chaos of the natural world. He was killed by gods including Odin. Odin who is also known as the Allfather as having supremacy over all the Azir gods. And following Ymir Mir's death, Odin and the other gods used up all of his body to create the universe. For example, his brains formed the clouds and his bloods created the seas and so on and so forth. And because of this, because of his fundamental role within the creation story, Ymir has come to represent not only chaos, but the transition from chaos to order. The idea that the god supposedly used his evil body to bring structure and order into the world. The most obvious connection that I was reminded of when I first read or heard about Ymir was Imu. For one, I think even their names sound somewhat similar, but probably more importantly is the fact that Imu is the head of the world government, and so in that sense you could say that Imu is a figure who has transitioned the world who has taken the world from the chaos of the Void Century War era to the current world that exists today, which is very ordered, very structured. He brought order into the world. He's the head of the world government, which sets the rules, sets order. And yet at the same time, Imu can also represent an unsettling and evil force, given Imu is a major antagonist within the series. And now you might point out to me like, hang on, wait a second, that doesn't really make sense. If Ymir is the ancestor of all the Jotnar, of all the Jotuns, aka giants, then this would mean that Imu should represent the forefather or the creator of all the Elbafians, potentially all the giants that we're going to get in the series. And I just don't think it's quite that simple, primarily because at the end of the day, as much as Oda may have been inspired by Norse mythology, it's highly unlikely that he has taken it literally or word for word or one for one. This is always the case with Oda, he weaves in real life stories or weaves in 
real life myths and he does so in such a way where it fits his story rather than trying to just make his work, make his series a replica or a retelling of a pre-existing material. So as always, I think that's important to remember, not just for the rest of this discussion, but any future discussions we may have about history and the mythological inspirations that Oda has drawn from. But also, it's not that simple because the giant race or the Jotun and all the races that exist in Norse mythology is a lot more complex than that. So this brings us to our second very important element. Aside from Ymir, another very important element to the Norse mythology, to Norse cosmology, is the existence of Yggdrasil, also known as the World Tree. Norse mythology is based in a universe that is made up of nine realms, and each of these realms are connected to Yggdrasil, hence why it's called the World Tree. And these nine realms are divided for various species and beings who live in each of the realms. For example, the Azir gods, they're the primary gods that exist in the universe. They live in Asgard. We've got humans who live in Midgard. We've got the Jotun who are the giants, we've got different types of elves, dwarves and so on and so forth. And I'll get to looking at the races or the species in a second, but here we have to pause because obviously Yggdrasil is now a confirmed part of One Piece itself. So we've all suspected that that large tree that we've seen in Big Mom's flashback was going to be a representation of Yggdrasil. I don't know if I was quite expecting Oda to go directly or go explicitly name it Yggdrasil, but as of chapter 1127, Yggdrasil is a One Piece canon. As to how we can can apply the existence of Yggdrasil into One Piece. There are lots of ways I think we could choose to interpret this. First is that Yggdrasil and the nine realms that exist in Norse mythology may represent Elbaf and Elbaf having nine different regions. You know, each section, each region could have its own culture and weather and geographical features, you know, very similar to what we saw in Wano. For example, the Legoland that we've seen since chapter 11 126. That might just be a characteristic of one of these nine realms. Alternatively, the nine realms could depict the different races that exist in One Piece, which is a bit tricky to explain because admittedly there are more than nine races in One Piece, but this could be explained in a certain way where certain races are just offshoots of a primary nine species types. What I'm trying to say is there could have been originally nine races and then throughout time and throughout evolution, we've resulted in the number of species and the number of races that exist today. For example, the Lunarians, they might be a particular giant race. The Buccaneers, we know them to have descended or to be somehow related to the giant race. Actually, going back to the Lunarians, they may actually even be a particular type of Jotna that exists in Norse mythology because there is something called the Fire Giants. And I think Fire Giants is something that is actually quite fitting for the Lunarians. But anyways, here's something about the Jotnar or the Giants. According to Norse mythology, the Jotnar are regarded, often regarded as evil, whereas the Azir, which I mentioned earlier, are known to be the gods. But the relationship between the Jotnar and the Azir gods is very complicated. Even though these two groups are often seen to be at war, they're often in conflict, they also often have relations with each other. The greatest example is probably Thor, which is one of the major gods within Norse mythology. Despite being one of the Azir gods, Thor was actually also part Jotun because of his mother and his grandmother. Or even Loki. Loki, also considered part of the Azir gods, is actually a Jotun by birth. Meaning that this status of Jotun or Azir god can sometimes change, sometimes people or sometimes beings may be accepted into godhood. And how this relates to One Piece is that for all intents and purposes, it seems like the Elbafian giants are supposed to represent the Jotna, primarily because the Jotun, the Jotna, are now commonly known as giants, even though, fun fact, originally it might not have been that giants or Jotun 
was supposed to represent anything that is that large in stature. But anyways, especially given that Loki of Elbaf, Prince Loki of Elbaf, is most likely connected to the god Loki, who as I said, is actually by birth a Jotun. And although the Jotun are considered evil in ancient Norse mythology, I think rather than focusing on this idea of evil, I think Oda may have just leaned into the idea of the Jotun being troublesome, of them being brash or violent. After all, Saul expresses disgust at the Elbafians. He doesn't want to be associated with them. I think that's because the Elbaf similar to the Jotun, are supposed to be known as sort of these rougher, troublesome creatures. But also, what's interesting is that even in Norse mythology, there are different types of giants. Like I said earlier, there's the fire giants or there's the frost giants, and I think that might be the basis of why we have various different giant types within the One Piece universe. From appearance to personalities and cultures, the various giant species or the various giant races within the One Piece universe are shown to be very distinct. And so equally, the ancient giant race, they may represent the Jotun, which is also interesting because the name Ors, the name of the first ancient giant that we met at Thriller Bark. Ors is actually the name of one of the Norse gods, who according to some accounts is actually thought to be an incarnation of the All Godfather, the All Father Odin. Anyways, if we go back to Yggdrasil, aside from the Nine Realms and their various inhabitants, there are two other creatures, very important creatures who reside at Yggdrasil. The first is a huge eagle that sits in its branches. The second is an evil dragon, an evil serpent that resides at the base. And the eagle and the dragon are said to be enemies, often at odds with each other. And I think this may also be very relevant for the One Piece universe, because the way that I've chosen to interpret this is that the serpent or the dragon that sits at the base is actually supposed to be represented by the celestial dragons. And the eagle is going to be represented by whatever comes out of that giant egg that we saw on Roger's ship. The one that has yet to be explained, but I'm going to guess that there is going to be some sort of relationship and that's going to be quite important to the series. Something else that is very central to Norse mythology is the concept of time and that's also quite heavily interrelated with the concept of fate. There are conflicting opinions about how time was understood according to Norse mythology and I'm not here to tell you which one's correct or accurate, but I think what is relevant for today's discussion is that one popular interpretation, one popular account, is the idea that the concept of time is cyclical. It's cyclical rather than linear. Time in Norse mythology represents natural cycles of life, death, and rebirth. But like I said, the concept of time is also heavily related to the concept of fate. Fate, also known as Verd in Norse mythology, is overseen by these three supernatural beings that reside in Yggdrasil. And these beings, they weave the destiny of all things. They control the past, present, and future. And you can't escape this destiny. If we translate this into the One Piece world, well, we already know that fate exists and it's quite a prominent idea within the series. I'm sure people are going to be a little upset or at the least apprehensive about the idea that everything's going to come down to fate and destiny, especially the idea of there being actual figures that control and weave everything that happens because that would mean that there's no free will in the world. And then what would that say about Luffy as a character? Now, aside from clarifying that even within Norse cosmology, these beings that control fate, they don't determine absolutely everything. For example, sometimes they just determine when something will happen as opposed to how something will happen. Sometimes they'll just say when someone is going to die. What that means is that that outcome, that death is inescapable, but that doesn't necessarily limit free will because the person can still act and can still respond in ways, but it just won't change the outcome. More importantly, as we have already established, Oda isn't going to take things word for word. He's going to find a way to make ideas work for his story, even if he's borrowing some of these 
ideas. Anyways, the notion of fate and destiny, as I said, it already exists in the series, so I don't think that should be very controversial. As for the cyclical nature of time, I've actually already theorized in the past that the entire world of One Piece, that this story and what's taking, what's unfolding in front of us is part of a cycle. The main premise of this discussion that I made in the past was that the story of the Void Century is actually Luffy's story that is taking place in the current universe or in the current timeline, meaning that the story of the past is actually also taking place in the present. This is why that final island is called Laugh Tail, because it's actually supposed to be Luffy's tail or Luffy's tail. And this can explain things like why Roger said he was too early, because obviously Luffy hadn't been born yet. And look, I've discussed this in greater detail in another video, highly recommend you to watch that video. I will also post the link of that below. But even putting wild theories aside, the cyclical nature of time is also somewhat present, especially through recent developments or through recent reveals. One, we have the idea of Luffy as Joy Boy, as a reincarnation of Joy Boy, who's come back 800 years into the future. And Luffy, this reincarnation of Joy Boy, is also something that was prophesized. We also have the idea of an ancient civilization that is actually a lot more technologically advanced than the present. This idea of a great war that occurred 800 years ago, and yet Vegapunk also said that this war is not over, and it's going to continue, it's going to reoccur in the future. Not to mention another huge development that the world, the previous ancient civilization all sunk underwater, that the world that exists today is actually the rebirth of the former world. And then on top of this, we're going to witness another rebirth because the current world is also going to be no longer because the current world will also sink again. So this idea of the cycle of past, present, future, how they're all interwoven, how it's a continuous circling story, that's I think quite present in One Piece today. And to better understand time, fate, and this concept of cycles, this is all very closely related to the idea or the concept and the prophesized event of Ragnarok. Ragnarok is another very, very important part of Norse mythology. In case you haven't heard of it already, it is the name of a major war that's going to happen between the Jotun and the gods. It's a war that hasn't happened yet, but it's prophesized will occur, and it's prophesized that this war is going to result in the death, the end of the world. It's going to result in the death of many high-profile gods, including Odin and Thor. And although it hasn't happened yet, it is commonly understood because it has been prophesized, it's going to happen. The outcome is inevitable. But it's also believed that this catastrophic world event is actually not just going to result in the death of the world, but the rebirth of the world. And this is an idea that I think we can safely assume that Oda has definitely been inspired by, especially for the upcoming Great War that's going to mark the final saga of One Piece. If Ragnarok is the final battle that will end the world or end the current world, it's a massive battle involving the gods, the giants, all these other monsters and creatures. It seems that it's very much going to be represented by this impending final war of One Piece that's like Ragnarok going to involve all these sorts of players, all these different groups and factions. Oda has mentioned in the past that this final war is going to make that mega war at Marineford look cute. But a very particularly interesting parallel is that it's actually said that at the end of Ragnarok, it was prophesied that the world is going to be submerged underwater. And now this has obviously also entered the One Piece canon. Even more interestingly, we know that this has already happened in the past because according to Vegapunk, the pre previous world sunk underwater by 200 meters, which again reflects that sort of cyclical idea that we were just discussing. And the Megapunk said that this is likely to occur again. Past, present, future, life, death, rebirth, cycles. And just as Ragnarok is supposed to be a symbol of not just death, but rebirth, this idea of renewal, we're also very much expecting that Luffy is going to bring about a new dawn, he's going to bring about a new era following the death of this current world, following the final 
epic war of the series. What's really interesting about Ragnarok is that in Norse mythology, Loki plays a major role in the final battle. Loki is supposed to lead the Jotnar and he's supposed to lead the monsters into battle. These monstrous creatures who, by the way, he has three and they're actually his offspring. But Loki leads these giants and these monsters against the gods to fight the gods in Ragnarok. Now, we haven't yet made a direct connection between the Azir gods in Nordic mythology to any particular group or any particular series or faction in One Piece yet. But I guess in this scenario, this could really mean that Loki, Prince Loki of Elbath, might play a major role in potentially leading the Elbafians, potentially other races such as those races that are related to giants like the Buccaneers, and Loki may be a central figure in leading all those people into war, into battle against the Celestial Dragons. In that case, Celestial Dragons being a representation of the Azir Gods. Now it's fun to think about Loki, especially in the wake of chapter 1127, where we were introduced to this shape-shifting gigantic creature that wears a crown. Knowing the shape-shifting ability of the Nordic Loki, I immediately assumed that this creature in the Legoland castle, I thought that this may be actually Prince Loki. And especially given that Loki of Norse mythology is known to be a trickster, he's mischievous, he's a witty god, perhaps for the purposes of One Piece, Oda has created a similarly playful and sort of naughty young prince in the form of Prince Loki. And what we've witnessed in chapter 1127, I assumed was a young prince. Prince Loki, seeing as he is only 63 years old, which is relatively young when you consider the old age of giants, this is Loki just having fun, being a little mischievous. What's actually interesting is that Loki, Prince Loki of Elbaf, Prince Loki of the One Piece story, it actually is possible that that name might refer to a number of different figures that have similar names within Norse mythology. Another big example is Laufey. Laufey, which sounds very much like Loki, especially when you think about pronunciations in Nordic culture, in ancient Norse. And then that obviously, however, makes you think about Luffy because Luffy, 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 Luffy. But actually, I think the more obvious connection, the more obvious character or being that we can connect to Luffy within Norse mythology, within the Norse pantheon, is actually a god, or I should say a goddess called Sol, who is the goddess of of sun, the sun goddess. In general, the sun is an important, very important element within Norse culture. Archaeologists have found various artifacts like sun wheels and solar symbols on their runes, and it's believed that Vikings and ancient Norsemen greatly revered the sun. Whereas for Sol, the goddess of sun, it was understood that Sol moves across the sky and therefore brings light into the world. And it was also believed that Sol was being constantly chased by this wolf named Skull. And it was prophesied that during the Ragnarok, that wolf, that wolf Skull, would finally catch up to Sol, devouring the sun goddess, and therefore that would plunge the world into darkness. However, following Ragnarok, it was believed that Sol's daughter was going to take her place and and then that her daughter was going to bring light into the world following Ragnarok, this symbolizing renewal, rebirth, and continuity even in the face of destruction. And now this obviously makes you think about implications for Luffy and his fate by the end of the series. Is he gonna have a kid? No. Um, <laughs> the idea of Luffy dying before the end of One Piece, or at least the, even if he doesn't die, this idea that he's going to pass on his will to the new generation, these are ideas that have been discussed at length. They're somewhat popular ideas that exist already, but it also makes you wonder about the importance of the sun god to the Elbafians in general. We do know that they actually observe the solstice, we've seen this before, the solstice which is very closely related to reverence of the sun. The sun god was also named again in chapter 1127, and it's yet to be confirmed whether this sun god, this idea of soul, 
is related to their belief in Nika because we at least know that they are aware of Nika as the sun god. Which really makes you wonder what is Luffy's importance going to be within the Elbaf arc. If we think about other important figures within the Norse pantheon, one that really comes to mind for me is this idea of Idun, the goddess of spring, the goddess of rejuvenation. The reason why is because Idun is known to have a tree and this tree fruits golden apples. Apples. Golden apples that gives gods the power of immortality. And upon learning about this, I immediately obviously wondered whether this relates to Imu, whether it relates to the immortality of Imu and the celestial dragons, which has yet to be explained, or whether it alternatively even has to do with the creation or the birth of devil fruits itself. Another important possible connection between the world of Norse mythology and the world of One Piece is this existence of the Velmagir. Velmagir, which is said to be a well well, that's the source of all rivers, and I think that may be the inspiration for the all blue. Another important element is the existence of Bifrost. Bifrost is a bridge that connects different realms, the realms of Asgard and Midgard, the homes of the gods and humans respectively, and there are various ways to interpret how the Bifrost might be relevant to the world of One Piece, but the more prominent connections that I made was that the Bifrost could be represented by Tequila Wolf or all the alcohol alcoholic wolves that exist, the bridges that exist in each of the blues, but it could also even represent the red line. But in saying that, the red line is probably more obviously connected with this idea of the Jormungandr, the Jormungandr being another very important part of Norse mythology. I've actually created an entire video about Jormungandr and the red line, so I'll post that link below as well, highly recommend you go watch it. And look, there are just actually quite a lot of potential interpretations, possible connections and inspirations that Oda may have taken from Norse mythology into the One Piece world. For example, I think I could have an idea as to where Oda is going with Zoro's missing eye, and I plan to discuss that in another video, so make sure to keep tuned. But let me know if you find these discussions interesting, if you like learning more about Norse mythology and how it could relate to the world of One Piece. Again, not just Elbaf, but for the One Piece universe at large, because I think Oda has been heavily influenced in creating One Piece as a whole, not just the Elbafian arc, although obviously it's going to be a prominent feature of the Elbafian arc. But in the interest of time, I am going to wrap it up here, but please let me know again if this is something that interests you. Let me know in the comments below if you know anything else about Norse mythology that I've missed, because I love reading more about it. Of course, don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss out on our future videos. If you'd like to support the channel further, you can also become a patron Patreon or channel member and I do want to say a huge thank you to these executive officers for supporting this channel. This is Joy Girl and I'll see you again soon.